Gonna get famous. Okay, so we're gonna have a talk about the drama triangle. And this is all about how to learn to identify and understand the roles people play that create never ending drama in family, work circles, and friend circles. And recognize when you're falling into a drama triangle so you can take steps to break free from it and to be able to stay on a path to living a drama-free life. So this is based on the work of Stephen Cartman. Also, Chris West wrote a great book about this. Barry Weinhold and Janae Weinhold also wrote a really excellent book about this. Um, the best way to, to express what this is, I'm going to show you a little diagram I put together. Okay. So this kind of shows how a drama triangle works. So it kind of has, it's, a, it's destructive social interactions. There's a lot of blaming, name calling, people playing the victim, and it perpetuates itself, just creating suffering. So one role here is somebody who's playing the persecutor, okay? So they're aggressively judging. They see themselves as superior to other people. They believe you got to be ruthless to survive, like you got to be tough and ruthless to survive. Uh, they typically lack compassion for other people, the people they're judging or hurting. Uh, they're typically, these are people who are easily triggered and reactive, and they seek control usually at the expense of others, okay? So that's the persecutor role. Then we also have the victim role. So the victim role typically, it's not an actual victim in this instance, it's somebody who's pretending to be a victim. So they use endless excuses to avoid responsibility. They perceive themselves as powerless. They're seeking validation, sympathy, and attention. They rely on others to make choices for them telling them what to do or solve their problems for them. They lack confidence in their ability to succeed. They want others to feel bad for them. So really, the, these are people who don't actually want to get better. They just want you to feel bad for them is typically how this might play out, okay? And then the third rule is rescuer. So this is somebody who gets overly involved and oversteps their boundaries. They have difficulty seeing how their actions don't help or maybe even just make the whole thing worse. They want to be a saving hero, but they actually lack the proper skills needed to help. You know, they prevent others from learning personal responsibility. They prolong bad behavior by making excuses for people when they're behaving badly. They like to feel needed. So their main priority is to feel needed. Now, Sometimes with the rescuer, they don't, they may be good intentioned. They just don't have the ability to self-check and self-regulate that, that things aren't working out the way they're behaving. So what happens is these dynamics will play off each other. Other people might get dragged in, but nothing ever really goes anywhere. It just creates a lot of unnecessary suffering. So that's a bit of the drama triangle. Okay. So First of all, does anyone have any thoughts? Have you ever seen something like this, participated in something like this? Any initial thoughts on the drama triangle? Yeah, it I really- It's like two can be, two's company and three's a conflict. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, really, I really like how you were able to break apart sort of personality traits based on how they portray that role. And looking at all of them, I definitely saw people in each one of them that I've met or known. And then the one at the bottom, I'm like, I need the sheet. I need to send this to this guy. I'm like, I know for sure. Like, I'm like, Jesus, like, you read that, you know, that's you. We need to talk. Uh, um, that's interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. And, and one of the things that can happen with this cycle is that, um, is that people can switch roles. So somebody might begin as a persecutor. They might create gossip, character slander, lies, whatever. But then when people call them out on what they're doing, all of a sudden they play the victim. Why is everyone attacking me, right? Or somebody might be playing the victim like, oh, blah, blah, I have it so hard, poor me. But then when you're like, hey, why don't you go and do something about it instead of complaining? They're like, you don't know what it's like to be me. You have an easy life. You and they start persecuting you, right? So they might flip from victim to persecutor. Or somebody might come in and rescue. Maybe somebody's like overparenting is a common example of this where a parent is always making excuses for their child that does bad and they're trying to solve all their, they're trying to get involved and solve all their kids' problems. 
But then, you know, if it doesn't work, they start persecuting people. Or they might flip in the victim and be like, I did my best and things don't work out. Blah, blah, blah. So people will do a lot of what's called switching. So what we want to do probably next is build your drama triangle radar. So what I'm going to do here is this. We kind of have the three roles, right? And we got the rescuer, the persecutor, and the victim. So I'm going to play out a scenario and see if you're able to identify the roles. That's the first skill we want to develop in order to break free from drama. Okay? So here's an example. A landlord may offer a discounted rent to a family member. Okay? After a few months, the tenant realizes they cannot afford to pay the rent. They've been out partying and drinking and spending their money in all kinds of other frivolous ways, and they don't have any money for rent. So they discuss their situation with their girlfriend, hoping to gain sympathy for, for not paying rent. You know, and citing the rental agreements that, you know, were made in by those in power that, you know, so the girlfriend then says, oh, it's not your fault. This is actually the landlord's fault because he's taking advantage of those who have less and he's exploiting the less fortunate by being a landlord. You know, he's already got enough money. Like, and, and, you know, so what she starts to do then is she starts to spread a whole bunch of harsh lies about the landlord to the rest of the family. And then the tenant's father gets involved. And acting, you know, he shows up at the landlord's place, knocking on the door and confronts him, starts making all kinds of guilt-tripping accusations and blah, 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 to sort it out and just makes a whole mess of things. Okay, so in this situation, who is playing the victim? Who is playing the It sounded like the father. Uh, I thought the renter. <laughs> the renter? The girlfriend. I, I, think the the, I think it's the renter. Or the yeah. renter is the victim and the girlfriend is the persecutor and the dad is the... Um, is coming in trying to be hero. Yeah, the dad's the rescuer, the, the Hasselhoff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll play it out. Right now, like the renter is pretending like he's powerless to pay the rent. He could pay the rent. He could ask for, hey, I need another month. Or I'm just going to take out a loan and pay the rent. He could figure it away. Instead of figuring out a way, he's figuring out an excuse that implies he's powerless, right? So he's playing victim. Vic okay, okay. Right. And then he explains the story to the girlfriend as if he's a victim. It's not like, oh, hey, I made an agreement and I didn't carry out my end of the agreement. It's like, I can't pay my rent. Woe is me. So then they're coming in with a, you know, aggressively judging. Oh, it's not your fault. It's the, this guy's the bad guy. He's the villain. The landlord's the villain. He gave you, you know, discounted rent as a family member. He pretended like he was on your side. He's actually taking advantage of you. Right. So that's persecution. And then the dad getting involved in the whole thing based on a false narrative is rescuer. So that would be a drama triangle right there. So you can imagine how that one's going to play out. The target would be the landlord in this case, right? Okay, so we're going to go on to another example. All right, I'm going to pick a, here's one that's kind of funny and relevant, okay? So I want you to remember we got the persecutor, the rescuer, and the victim. So, a political candidate named Karen blames the current mayor for all the problems in the city, okay? They promise all the citizens are not at fault. You're all innocent. Uh, the mayor made false promises. Karen claims that if she gets elected, she'll fix the situation and make the city great again. However, after being elected, she performs worse than the previous mayor. Okay? Later, a candidate named Joe tells voters that they are not to blame for voting for Karen and that she was a con artist who deceived them. Joe promises to restore the, fit, the city and fix what Karen broke. However, once in office, Joe's performance is even worse than Karen's. Okay. What was Karen's original role? She's the one that was blaming the current mayor for all the problems in the city. What was her original role? Victim? Persecutor. Persecutor. 
Yeah. She's persecuting the current political leader. She's pitching you, the citizens, as the victims. Oh. Right? Hey, you're all innocent. You know, they broke promises. How does she pitch herself as? The rescuer. The rescuer. Yeah, yeah. She's pitching herself as rescuer. Now, what does Joe do? What does Joe start off doing? Same uh, thing she did. So yes, persecuting. He pitches the citizens as the victims, and he pitches himself as the rescuer. Now, is this a drama triangle that plays out in real world politics? No, Every you day. totally made this up. This is hypothetical. Real life doesn't work like this. <laughs> You know, this one's, a, this one's interesting because politics is one area where the drama triangling plays out. Another one is dogmatic religions will also be where, where you know, you're an innocent, innocent victim because somebody bit an apple once, you're, you're a, a horrible person, right? And, uh, you know, but our church will, you know, save you from, you know, whatever, right? So uh, there's a lot of different situations that teach people drama thinking drama triangle thinking that hey it's normal to persecute people people who have what you want persecute them so people start to subconsciously learn how to do drama triangling right yeah well and i think this one like you know the political um example you know is difficult too because you it doesn't matter which side you're on left or right not all solutions work not you know what i mean like no yeah. one is 100 percent responsible for all the bad or all the good and we look through you know like presidential cycles you know here in the u.s and in reality you know the president cannot affect the economy the stock market i should say that much they really don't have that much in there congress can mess with things so you've got a lot of dynamics where presidents will take hey look at i boosted up the economy i did this great thing when in reality it was decisions made two to three years before you know that run cycles and so yeah. they you'll get politicians doing this but it's never one side is always to blame or is always to um you know be be praised for doing you know, the best, there are good and bad policies that some help, some hurt, but this clearly happens all the time. Yeah. And people tend to see it in absolutes as black and white, good and bad, hot and cold, and this is all good or all bad. And, you know, it's really, it's really not, but we keep falling for it in general as a population. And, you know, just voting the same, you know, it's like that who song, right? Old boss, same, or the new boss, same as the old boss. Yeah. Right. It's the same crap, right? Obviously in this example, it just keeps happening, but it gets worse. Exactly. Exactly. And, and, you know, one of the things here on the, on the, on the diagram is usually the solution for the persecutor is ultimately to develop a compassionate heart because they're not relating to the struggle of other people. It's like, once you might get into the position they were in, you might realize all the stuff they were dealing with and all the struggle and all the pain they had to go through. And you might not have been so harsh if you can develop empathy for what and concern for what other people are going through. That's typically the solution with a persecutor. They just, they're, they're learning in the process of learning compassion. That's their journey, right? The rescuer is learning how to be a coach or a guide. They go from almost doing too much to learning how to help in a way that is helpful. And that journey basically is about teaching people to find the resources within themselves to solve their own problems, right? Rather than creating people that are dependent, you know, and enabling, right? And then for the victim, it really comes down to reclaiming their power. Like remind, reminding yourself you're in control of your choices and your decisions. And, you know, you have the capacity to get motivated. And you've done hard things before, you can do it again. Like they just need to reclaim their power and remember their past successes, whatever it is, and, and kind of um, 
take extreme ownership and have the courage to to take ownership of their lives more so rather than pretending to be a victim. Uh, you know, all honor and respect to actual victims, but in this case, it's more about somebody playing that role rather than being that thing. So, okay, let's go into an example uh, that's going to be a little bit harder because people are going to switch roles in this one. Okay, okay, but I want to just speak to this one that we just finished up because we see somebody who did switch roles, um, you know, it, it, from, you know, she was a persecutor or she came in as a rescuer and then she ended up kind of being the victim right alongside of, right? I mean, who who is this female mayor? Because the roles had changed. So she was coming in as the rescuer. Then she screwed it up worse than the first person now somebody else has come in and said hey wait look look at what she's done so now is she she become the punching bag as a victim not really so Target. Role- yeah it depends on how she it depends on how she positioned it she might have been like oh the current mayor made such a mess i couldn't help it i was helpless then it's a victim so now what you're seeing is the the target, right, of whatever the drama is, which is really the center of all this, because no matter if you're the victim, if you're the rescuer or the persecutor, what's created out of that that's used as the manipulation for it is the drama that's, you know, stirred up from it, because out of that drama is empowerment for that person who's stirring up the drama, right? So she initially as the persecutor, uh, use that drama that was created in order to empower her, which got her into office. But then she realized, you know, there was no compassion behind what she was doing. She was just bad mouthing the other one. And she found out whatever reason she's in the same boat and now she can't get out of it. And the other one now is using that to his advantage to persecute her. Still, the audience of the general population is the victim, but it's still the drama, and now it's being targeted toward her in order to empower him. And he, does, she doesn't have a leg to stand on because she's got no proof that she's been doing anything, right? Because she's she's messing it up worse. So the the target, I love that word, Charmaine, but uh, you know, the drama is actually what's being used as a vehicle to, to create power. Exactly, exactly. So persecutors want control. So they persecute so that what they can control now is the audience. Like, hey, now I've got I've got control. Everyone's on my side now. So they're persecuting to get control. Right? So that's that's usually where it's used. And people are rescuing as usually for a sense of purpose, they're rescuing. I have to bail people out. This is my purpose. I bail people out. And they may not actually be helping. They might be making things worse, right? You're so exactly it, right. Exactly right. Are they um, three different expressions of ego and kind of how I'm seeing it? Yeah. Yeah, you could you could say that. And I, I mean, I would, I, I would look at it as in all three levels or in all three positions, everyone's on a learning journey. Um. And I would look at it like that because it's kind of like, you know, as Chris West says in his book, the drama triangle does us all a favor ultimately. By us experiencing how not to live, we find the motivation to seek out how to live more harmoniously. Once we realize this doesn't work because of all the pain and suffering of the never-ending drama, that eventually humbles us to be more open-minded on how we can live more harmoniously. Right. So through people tend to learn best through personal experience and suffering is a more memorable teacher. So what happens is people suffer the rescuer role before they learn that it's wiser to empower people to solve their own problems than to try to do everything for them. People suffer the victim role you know, enjoying the hidden benefits, the love and attention of playing the victim until eventually they learn, they come to learn the the greater freedom and joy that comes from taking personal responsibility in life. You know, people suffer the persecutor role, but the thing with being the, the persecutor role is this, when you persecute other people, it creates disturbing energy within you. 
it creates a painful lack of inner peace. People who are persecuting all the time definitely are in a, you know, a self-created prison because of all this disturbing energy they're constantly generating and they're developing the persecution habit, which they may turn on themselves. They may start using a harsh internal dialogue, judging themselves, right? So I'd say it, it's almost like these are all like, um, it, it's almost, these are virtues being developed, but it's the painful process of getting there is how I would look at it. I, I think that in many cases, especially with drama triangling, I think that people are innocent in that they don't know what they don't know. Like if people were to able to like zoom out and see this kind of social dynamic for what it is, they would be like, I'm not getting involved in this. You know what? I'm going to stay clear of drama. When somebody invites me into a drama, I'm going to decline. Because when we see things from a higher perspective, we see that, you know, that block, the whole drama triangle, it blocks personal growth. It also holds society back. You know, with, with all the energy we spend on blaming and persecuting, we could spend that same energy on learning how to clean up all the plastic in the ocean or doing something more useful to the planet than just coming up with all this persecution and lies and slander and everything else. So I think it's just, you know, there are inescapable stages of character development and the soul's development and lessons. And I think the drama triangle represents just a whirlpool of suffering people go through, which ultimately can be a, a stepping stone to a greater understanding because nobody can find contentment forever in drama triangling. Like it's just, as much as you might find uh, some satisfaction from, you know, vilifying people and spreading rumors and some satisfaction from feeling needed temporarily, even though you're creating codependency and whatever, like it just never brings ultimate fulfillment. It seems like the path to fulfillment, but people just never get there. And so it keeps going around and around and around until they decide, I want to learn more, right? Rather than defending the way I am, I want to figure out the right way of living rather than always defending this way of living I've been doing, right? Because you might notice if you have a conversation with drama triangle with somebody before they're ready, they're just going to be a persecutor that's defending the idea of persecuting. You know, they're going to be a victim who's going to get mad at you for somehow suggesting that they're playing the victim and you don't understand what they're going through and they don't have power over the situation, blah, blah, blah. And they'll go after it, they'll start persecuting you or something else. Like, not everybody's going to be open to this information. And, you know, if, if they are not done playing the drama out, they're going to be quite resistant to it. Or they'll say, rescuer, that's not me, you know? Meanwhile, enabling all these, all kinds of things going on, right? Uh, do you find that they'll always play at least one, uh, or like all three roles, or will they be a dominant one? Or Yeah, you know, normally you find people have a predisposition to one of them. We will go into unpacking. Everyone will go into a self-check on each of the roles. Cool. Okay. It'll probably be in a future conversation. We're going to do a deep dive on the victim, and I'm going to have like, check these 15 things. How much of these attitudes do you resonate with, right? Check your baggage on this. Here's the persecutor baggage. How many of these attitudes apply to you? And you'll be able to see like how much of a predisposition do you have to each role, right? So it's kind of like, you know, um, so people will switch roles. Chris, I, hey, Chris, good to see you, man. Chris just threw a comment in there. If you're participating in the job and triangle, are you one role only or are you always switching roles? The key is it, typically people are switching. And uh, we'll go into an example of switching right now so people can understand how that works. Because you want to kind of see how the, the switching dynamic works. Did anyone else have anything they want to add? I'm sorry. I just kind of like, I tried to, hopefully I answered some of those questions there. Um, okay. Let's go into an example of switching. All right. Cheryl, and, and these stories are all made up. Okay. So if it, you know, like the politician one, you could say, oh, are you talking about so-and-so and so-and-so? -and -so? I'm like, no, I made that up, the Karen, the politician one. But, uh, you know, but I'm sure there are real life examples that mirror the examples I'm giving. I'm trying to give examples based on things I've coached people through and stuff. Okay. Cheryl meets Donald and Donald tells her all about his past relationship 
where his ex-girlfriend treated him poorly, took his money, cheated on him, and did all kinds of bad things. So Cheryl comforts him and says, you know what? It's not your fault. None of it's your fault. That's okay, blah, blah, blah. Once they move in, Donald's behavior changes. And he starts criticizing Cheryl with harsh accusations and judgments. He also starts overstepping boundaries and privacy by going through her phone and emails when she's not home. And he justifies this behavior by saying that he doesn't want to get fooled ever again. As a result, Cheryl starts to feel down on herself for being in yet another troubled relationship and starts to believe some of these accusations Donald's making about her. So she blames herself and feels hopeless. Later, Donald's mother gets involved and tries to fix the situation by taking Donald's side on everything without even speaking to Cheryl. You know, continuing the accusations against her and accusing her of being insensitive to Donald's feelings. All right. So then Cheryl then lashes out at Donald's mother for making the situation worse. And Donald's mother, you know, responds with, but I was only trying to help you guys. Okay. Let's see how well we're able to untangle this drama. What was Donald's original role? He started off, what, would be, what original role did he play in the triangle? Victim. How many people here say victim? Show of hands. Yeah, he's acting like nothing in the past relationship was his fault. If nothing else, his fault was he didn't have a good enough radar to be able to tell that he was with somebody who didn't have morals and standards or whatever. But it's also possible that there was a lot of things that he didn't admit that he had done wrong as well, right? So who knows, but he's pretending like, oh, none of it was my fault. Now, once he moved in with Cheryl, what role did he switch into? Oh, a persecutor. Yeah, so then he started persecuting her and he started excusing himself by saying, you know, I can, it's okay for me to do this because of what I've been through. Right. But that's part of the persecutor's myth. Some persecutors feel like they are exempt because of what they've been through. But we got to remember, you know, as Peace Pilgrim says, there's never a good reason to do a bad thing. Right. So this is kind of used as an excuse for undisciplined and bad behavior. People will use that as an excuse. Right. So, yeah, that's that's Donald's switch. He went from victim to persecutor. Okay. Now, let's go into Cheryl. Cheryl came in and she was like, blah, 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 it's not your fault, everything else like that. What role was she really playing? Uh, rescuer. Yeah, like she's kind of making excuses for him. She's not like, hey, what did you learn from that relationship? You know, uh, how can you be better in future? You know, where were you responsible and what went wrong? Even if it was only 5%, what was your 5%, right? Right. Hey, you know what? You've done hard things in your past. Maybe you can just, you can do hard things again. You've found a way to succeed through hard times. You're still here. Let's think about some of the things you've done to get through adversity in your past and maybe do some of that now, right? Like there's a, there's a way to actually be a little bit more of a, a coach and actually help rather than just nothing's your fault. Don't learn anything. Let's move forward together, right? Um, now, Cheryl then ended up in this relationship with this guy who's accusing her. And she kind of got down on herself and stayed in it. It was a toxic relationship she stayed in, right? What role did she flip into once he started persecuting her? Victim. Back, back Victim, yeah. Victim. So she started to be powerless, right? You know? And then, uh, and then Donald's mother comes in and takes Donald's side without hearing the full story. Just jumps in. Now, and do we know how she came into the mix? We would say that Donald explained they're having relationship difficulties. Because now he's a victim again, but he can't go to the persecutor for it. So he's got to find another person to rescue him. So yeah, another back rescuer. to mommy. Mm -hmm. You're right. You're right. That's, that's how it typically happens. 
rescuer. I love it. So smart, Patty. You figured it. Yeah, he would have. Typically, in this type of situation, they play victim to mommy. Oh my gosh, I'm with this girl, and blah blah. blah. We moved in, and I'm in love, but you know, we're having some issues, and I've done everything I can do, and I can't make it any better, and blah blah. blah. And you know, so he would have pitched a probably a story that was slander to her. And wasn't, uh, you know, divulging any of the wrongdoing he did and was probably lying and exaggerating about her, right? That's typically what would happen here. Um, this is a classic example. It plays out all the time. And but, uh, so the parent comes in and what role is mom playing? Rescuer. Yeah, kind of meddling. And persecutor, both. Yeah, y- yes. Yes, yeah. Comes in. judging, yeah. And then, yeah. Comes in as a rescuer, does persecution as the way of resolving it. Now, let me ask you this. Whenever you were wrong on something in life, or you made an innocent mistake and you didn't mean to, and somebody persecuted you, did it really inspire you to be a better person, or did it shut you down and make you a bit, of, a bit resentful? Like, you know, even when persecution is justified, it still doesn't isn't the best way to resolve anything, is it? Just think about it. when you're wrong on something. Do you want people to be really harsh and persecute you, or do you want them to be kind of like more gentle? Hey, you know what? I've made mistakes too. You know, like we've all been through it. Let's see what we can all do to make things better here. Like, so the key here is that persecution just generally is a low quality approach to resolving any dynamic like this, anyway. So she jumps into persecutor, uh, and she starts persecuting Cheryl. Cheryl lashes out at her. So what did Cheryl switch into? She did all three roles. Finish persecutor. Yeah, yeah. Then what does Cheryl's mom do? Do or no? What does Donald's mom do? He says, "Oh, I was only trying to help." Victim. That's a victim play. Yes. Covered up by victim, but I did like the fact that Cheryl also switched into being her own rescuer. Um, starting to lash out. Well, it wouldn't really be considered being your own rescuer. A rescuer would be somebody who kind of steps in and tries to do too much for somebody else. Of you might course. say that she was standing up for herself. Yeah. But she was she was standing up by playing another drama role. So rather than reclaiming her power, right, what she did was she went to playing the persecutor role, which doesn't really resolve things much no. either. Right? Because now, now the, the mom is flipping into victims. See how everyone's just rotating roles. It's not going anywhere. It's not actually resolving anything. Now, to actually kind of like really, you know, get to the bottom of this, if somebody wanted to, then the, there's drama stopping approaches you could you could take, right? Like you could say, all right, what are the actual facts? Not stories. Challenge any stories that are being presented as truth. The key with drama triangling is people will tell stories that typically aren't true. A persecutor is going to start exaggerating. Usually they mix a lot of lies and slander in. Um, so the key is just, let's just get to the fact. When you're going to tell by the language too, right? Because they're going to use absolutes like you always do this or you never do that. Too. And you just, what are the it's facts? Exaggeration like you're saying, right? Yeah, yeah. And so if someone is saying, you know, well, you frequently do this or something like that, then you can tell that they're kind of getting closer to the truth and representing it. But when they're going to those absolute language, yeah, you know, they're full of crap and that they're they're trying to cover themselves and, you know, present themselves as, you know, sterling while the other person is tarnished. And so that's a telltale sign that you are not getting to the bottom when you're trying to, you know, get resolution from someone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. So, um, absolutely, absolutely. Now, so yeah, that example would be one that could be a common example of how drama triangling might play out, right? With people switching roles. It could happen at work. You know, it could happen like family. It could be this could play out in in many different ways. But the idea, the thing with it is, it just goes around. It's never ending. It doesn't go anywhere productive when people play these roles, right? 
So let's do one more example and then we'll move on. Final example here that we'll do is this. Okay. So I want you to watch for switches. There's going to be a couple switches here. See if you can sense it. And by this point, we should be able to develop a good radar for drama. Okay. So Marco is a neighbor who shovels Emma's driveway without being asked. Then he demands that she invite him over for dinner because he shoveled her driveway. Now, she declines because she's in a committed relationship. She's got a long-term boyfriend, and she suspects Marco has different intentions here. So then Marco becomes angry and calls her all kinds of horrible names. You're an ungrateful, blah, 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 and, and yells and screams and gets, gets really mad, okay? All kinds of, like, verbal abuse, okay? Feeling guilty, Emma then goes to his house the next day and brings him cookies, okay? She is then able to, he, Marco then charms her into leaving her boyfriend and starting a relationship with him, all right? So now she moves in with this guy and the relationship becomes very abusive. He is like cheating on her constantly. He's making excuses for his bad behavior. He's constantly being emotionally abusive towards her, just like he was on day one, right? And he tells her that their relationship is real and authentic, while all the other relationships out there that appear drama-free are all fake. And she believes him. This is real. This is what real relationships are like. And she stays in the abusive relationship. Okay. So. All right. He started as a rescuer by trying to shovel her snow. And, and but it's, it's like with intentions of getting something back. Right. I think that's actually called grooming, not rescuing. I think that's <laughs> grooming. And this guy's got some skills. She comes over with cookies and she leaves her boyfriend. What does this guy say? I like, that's a skill. Like that's fast. Uh, so this is what's called a need, need obligate system. It's a form of manipulation. When you do something without being asked, then expect and obligate people to return a favor to you. That's manipulation. It's called the need obligate system of manipulation. <laughs> hey, I shoveled your driveway. You owe me dinner. That's actually manipulation, especially if people don't repay you in the way you want them to, then you persecute them. That's actually a sign of a manipulator, right? Yeah, it's a, as Chris said, it's an indirect contract that people didn't agree to. It's like, what? I didn't ask for this help. And now you're blaming me and yelling at me and blah, blah, blah. So, you know, that's, so yeah, Marco starts off as a rescuer, then switches into a persecutor when he doesn't get what he wants for rescuing, right? Which is a classic form of manipulation used by people who are abusive. So right? would you say persecutors normally find themselves victims as uh, significant others? A lot of times they'll, they'll latch onto a victim for a significant other because they can control them? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. So now, and, and we'll talk about that. What role did uh, Emma play? Victim. She, she definitely ended up as a victim. Like, I can't get out of the situation. This is just what normal relationships look like. You know, it's just he goes around and he cheats and he's verbally abusive and everything else. This is no, meanwhile, the, the guy she was with in a functional relationship is long gone. And now she's with this manipulator who kind of like charmed her and she's in the victim seat, right? Like for pretending to be powerless. But, you know, she might be innocent and not realizing that and not, and not having a greater understanding for everything that's unfolded here, right? So, you know, and one of the greatest tricks of manipulation is to put in your, in your mind the thought that this toxic situation is normal. That's one of the greatest tricks of manipulation. So that's why I use that example. It's because if you believe that lie, that this drama life is normal, 
That's how people hook you into a drama triangle, right? They can get you to believe that this is normal, everything else is fake, then they got you. And then they can flip you into a victim. It's a victim invite. So, excellent. So we kind of have a good radar, all right? So let's see how well we're able to pick up if a drama is brewing. Because the way that this stuff works, here's how a drama triangle will work. It begins with an invitation, such as a, a victim statement from somebody. Like, oh, poor me, like, woe is me, let me tell you, like, uh, all my situation, right? Like, they could, they could invite you to play rescuer by giving you their victim story, right? That, that's called an invitation. It could be somebody blaming somebody else. You know, it's like, all of our problems are because of this person here, and this person's a horrible person, and blah, 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 blah. And they're, they're, tr and they're trying to hit a hot button in you to get you to engage with either jumping in and trying to fix it as a rescuer, you know, jumping in as a persecutor or as a victim, like, oh my gosh, yeah, you're right. They totally screwed us over and we're innocent and we're tired of being victimized by this person. So they're inviting you into the drama with their persecution, right? So that could be an invite as well, or it could be an uninvited interference where somebody's like imposing in your situation and they're trying to pull you into a drama. They're like, oh, hey, like, you know, uh, I'm going to bring your ex-boyfriend to the party because, you know, you just need to build the hatchet because even though he lied and cheated and betrayed you and everything else, like, you know, you just need to look past all that stuff, right? Like, learn to forgive, right? And it's like, you know, it's like, what are you doing? Like, you're trying to rescue the situation. You're making it worse now. Like, you know, they haven't learned their lessons. They haven't changed their lessons. Like, why are you trying to pull this person in and teach them that there's no consequences for that behavior? You know, so that could be like a rescue invite, right? So what happens is there's an invitation is how people get started on this. The invitation is intended to hit a trigger or a hot button, something that gets you like to want to participate in it, right? And then after that, you know, people take on roles and the situation escalates. They try to pull other people into it. Oh, this is a problem that also involves so-and-so. Let's pull them in. This is a problem that also involves sins, or let's pull them in, right? And then it just leads to an increase in blame, shame, guilt, rules switch around, but no resolution is ever reached in a drama triangle. That's the key. The only way to win the drama triangle is to get out of it, right? Because the people in it don't want it to ever be resolved. They're getting benefits from it. Persecutor feels in control. They can just say whatever bad things they want, and they feel like they're in control when they do. They feel superior, right? Rescuer feels a sense of purpose. And they feel needed. That's more important to them than actually helping, right? The victim gets all the love and attention from being a victim. You know, so it's their, it's their primary strategy to, to fulfill the need for love and attention, right? Now, are there better ways to get these needs met? Of course. Right, But at this point, people are learning the wrong way. They're experiencing the wrong way in order that they might value the right way later on at some point in their journey. Right, They might be like, hey, I've tried to live that way. It doesn't work. Oh, my God. I used to play the victim and try to get everyone to feel sorry for me. Oh, it's actually kind of draining. Like It's not really that great. So that's how it works. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a couple invites out there, and I want to see if you can tell what kind of an invite it is. Is this a persecutor invite, a victim invite, or a rescuer invite? Okay? So, here's number one. Somebody tries to turn you against somebody else by speaking negatively about them. What kind of an invite is that? Persecutor. persecutor. Yeah, that's a persecutor invite. Like, they're trying to speak negatively about somebody else and turn you against somebody. Okay? Somebody says to you, oh, poor you, it's not your fault. What's that? Yeah, so they're, they're, they're pitching you. And they might be like a rescuer, pitching you as a victim. Right? Absolutely. How about this? Uh, someone steps in and makes excuses for you when you're clearly in the wrong. Rescuer. They try to get you out of taking responsibility. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Now, here's another one. Um, someone seeks support and sympathy from you for a problem that they complain to be powerless to resolve. Victim. Victim. Yeah. So they're acting helpless and they're trying to get you to feel bad for them. Right. Could be victim. All right. The victim invite or they're, they're inviting you to be their rescuer. Yeah, but it could be, it could, but you could also come in, you could come in as a rescuer. Or you could play with them and misery loves you. You could be like, well, this person's a horrible person. Uh, just right? So you might, you might get, you might jump in playing either role, persecuting or rescuing. Oh, let me fix it. I'm going to go talk to them. What about victims? Do they hang out together? Like, you know, we're both victims. Is that a thing? Victor, I mean, here's the thing. I mean, it, <laughs> Sure, sure they could misery loves company they could also yeah that's what i was thinking misery loves company <laughs> if victims are, are among other victims basically the conversation is something like this isn't it awful and that's it because they're kind of like, like a fixed mindset that the situation is bad without any like hey how can we make things better you know what's good what can we learn how can we make things better don't say that you're going to ruin our victim party you know like that's so funny so that's kind of like how it'll play out, the right? Party. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, so the key is, like, there are some drama-stopping responses. Uh, first of all, if somebody's giving you an invite, does anyone have any thoughts or ideas on how you can avoid getting dragged into a drama triangle, like what you can do here? Do not RSVP. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I didn't get your save the date. I apologize. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I don't want to have a response that's any of the roles. Maybe you ask questions. Yeah. I like with the, yeah. the persecutor in particular, I tend to, to say little, very little. Um, and that's so that the other people can notice how unreasonable they're being. Yeah, yeah. So what you could do is you could just say, hey, look, is there something you want from me? So when somebody does that, hey, look, and if you know they start telling you their sob story as a victim, you just say, "Is there something you want from me? You know, is there something you want me to do about it? No. Well, well you don't know. Okay. Well, think about it and get back to me. Right? Because immediately you're, you're switching them from problem-focused thinking as a victim to solution-focused. What do I want from you from here? Meanwhile, they don't want to say, "Hey, I just want you to feel bad for me." Like that's you know, are they going to come right and say that, or are we going to be like, "Oh, I don't know. I'm just so confused." Right? With a persecutor, they might be like, okay, what I want from you is I want you to totally cut this person out of your life, right? And then you might say, well, I haven't even spoken to them yet. I haven't heard their side of the story. Like, you know, you, you could say, like, you can give them your reasons for not following through if you want, right? So that could be an approach. Ask them, do you have a specific request? Like, what do you want from me here? And if you're unsure, get back to it and let me know. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is ask for facts, not stories. I don't care how somebody made you feel. It's like your feelings may have been inappropriate. Nobody makes you feel anything. Feelings are determined by how you interpret your life and your life experiences. I might feel a roller coaster is scary or I might feel it's exciting. If a tree falls in the woods, was it really attacking you and your character or was it just falling? You know, like. Your feelings may not be appropriate. We should clarify which feelings are appropriate and which feelings are subject to misunderstanding. And then take action on the feelings that are appropriate, honor the feelings that are appropriate, right? So, you know, we want to get down to what are the facts, right? You could do that. Challenge any stories that are being presented with as truth. So you're saying this person's a bad person. Where's your proof? Is this just a rumor and gossip? So that can, that can stop it dead in its tracks, right? Or you could do this. You could say, I don't feel this conversation is going in the right direction. Let's get back to talking about baseball. Like, <laughs> you know, if somebody starts talking back to somebody else or, you know, whatever. They do, hey, I don't feel this conversation is going in the right direction. You know, or, you know, what you could do, Dave, like you said, with questions, you could just say, so what are all the possible solutions at this point? 
So rather than just spinning the wheels, persecuting or playing the victim and whatever, just say, what are all the possible solutions? You're switching somebody's thoughts from being problem obsessed to solution focused. So that could be another approach, right? Now, what will happen is this. Here's something that will happen. If you try to stop the drama with any of those drama stoppers, the first thing they're likely to do is ignore what you just said and did and not even acknowledge it and go right back to what they were doing. Okay? That's usually number one what they do. Right? They might also then try to push your buttons to get you involved. They might try to say some things that they know will trigger you and get you to react. Okay? They could say, hey, you should really care about this because so-and-so is suffering and you care about them and it's because of this, blah, 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 whatever, right? They're going to try to push your buttons. Now, if they try to push your buttons and it doesn't work to get you back into a drama, what happens when you go to a vending machine and you hit the button and it doesn't give you whatever you paid for? You start kicking, kicking the, machine. the machine. You start hitting all the buttons you can trying to get something. So this is what drama people do is they'll just try to put everything they can, right? And if they can't get it to work with you, they'll do it to somebody else. They'll press a button. If, it doesn't, if they don't get the response they want, you're not going to jump in and persecute or rescue. They start pushing all kinds of buttons, right? Like, so um, that's an approach too. And the key thing here is you could just say, like, if they try to push your button with a statement, you could just say, Thank you, I'm aware of that. Or thank you, I wasn't aware of that. And leave it at that. And then the other key here is to avoid being pulled back into a drama. Just stay strong and remember that the more you resist drama, the easier it gets every time. Because people are always going to try to pull you back into it. They love it. It's just like, it goes around and around. And um, Barry and Janae Weinhold wrote a book on this. And they actually had a theory, and it's kind of funny. They said that in the drama triangle, their theory is that each person is striving to be the victim in the end. It's the ultimate prize is to be the victim because it allows you to get all your needs met without direct communication and you can blame everyone else for your failures. So the rescuer will play the victim when their attempts to help fail. The persecutor will play the victim when they are called out for their persecution actions. The victim uses endless excuses to play the victim and avoid responsibility. They convince you they've tried everything. They've done all they can do, and it's in somebody else's hand to fix the situation, right? All of them want the love and attention and the easy, the perceived easy role of playing the victim. So they're all competing for the victim's cup. That's it. It's this, the victim's cup, Right. So that's and, an interesting theory. I mean, I can actually see there being a high possibility of that being accurate, right? Because just think about everything that, you know, that is just kind of going on in the world right now. If you're the victim, it's not your fault you don't have a job, even though there's millions of jobs available, right? If you're the victim, then you can never... You don't have to put forth any work, any effort. You don't have to be consistent. You don't have to get up early. You don't have to put in long days. You can simply sit back and say, I'm going to take what the world gives me. And it's not my fault. And I mean, that is, it's beyond the path of least resistance. I don't even know what to call that. But if you default to that, which so many people do, then they don't, they don't ever have to change. They don't ever have to stop the way they eat or drink or their bad habits, their terrible relationships, how they treat other people, any of those things. They just get away with it all until someone punches them in the mouth. And, you know, I mean, kind of look at, you can see that kind of stuff just through social media and how, cyberbullying and all these things have come up right because it's so easy and i can just go blame someone else for all my crap or go persecute somebody without getting punched in the mouth right because but we Steve, all know if you punch them in the mouth they're still the victim 
That's true. <laughs> but there's three things that are I want everyone to realize. There's three right. things for your for your dental hygiene that are very important, right? Brushing, flossing, and minding your own damn business. And so if you do those things, you'll have good oral hygiene. But you know, the problem is people aren't called out and they're not held accountable because of the rescuer part of that, right? Where a true rescuer would be someone that would help someone develop the tools and skill set to change the way they look at the world, to actually pull themselves out of their emotional dumpster that they live in, to you know become powerful and move on instead of being a manipulated rescuer that is trying to get something out of it and then potentially move into that victim thing. You know, someone that really wanted to help would come to help, not come with, you know, an agenda and just take, you know, like the the, the one you did, Brenda, where, you know, the mom comes in. Oh, well, not my little Johnny, right? He's so perfect, little angel. Bull crap, man. You know, like when my kids pulled that crap with us in school, they knew and they got a final warning. If I go talk to your teacher and you have lied or misrepresented your part in this scenario, I'm going to beat your ass. Oh, yes. Yeah. Because if you have lied and tried to manipulate us to go to bat for you, you're going to get it. And so you can come clean right now. And most of the time they did because they knew they were going to get the hammer Thor dropped on their head. But if they could look me in the eyes and say, no, this is going on. That's fine. I'm going to help you and we're going to resolve it. But, you know, we are not stupid to think that our kids are not pricks and that they don't do crap sometimes. And I do crap sometimes. I mean, come on, you know. And so, you know, that that's the thing, though. You cannot just blanket believe someone's that they are always right and the other party is always wrong. So how dare you, bad girlfriend, treat my son like this? You know, that kind of crap. If you're clearly part of the problem, if you are entering this triangle like that. I'm not sure if the rescuers always think that the other person's right, but I think they make excuses for them. Sometimes right. it's just like, well, they're only behaving this way because this happened to them and you need to help them through this. So it's almost like excusing the bad behavior by saying there's a reason for it and you should be helping them too you know, instead of um, holding them accountable for their behavior, despite what's happened to them. That's why I don't let people shovel my driveway. I pump off <laughs> rounds with my shotgun and say, get away. And I'm not giving you cookies. You stay away from me. You know, I, now one of the things that I really like about your approach, Steve, is, is that you talk about keeping people accountable if they're going to try to use drama to manipulate. Hey, you better not misrepresent your part in this, because if you do, that's manipulation. So this somebody like a, a gaslighting narcissist, right? There's a lot of drama triangling because they're never wrong. You know, they feel they are more important than others, and they are masters of manipulating people to ever avoid personal responsibility, right? So they're they're likely to do a lot of that. But if you're just saying, hey, in this place, if you do that, I respond by doing this. Right. A lot of rescuers are actually what can be apparently well intentioned, but just may lack the self awareness of how ultimately they just keep making things worse. So it, it, it's usually like a lack of self awareness a lot of times with rescuers. Because later on, like a lot of people that I know that have kind of been that rescuer, they're like, at the time, I didn't know any better. I thought I would be helping. Then I realized I needed a PhD, a triple PhD in psychology to help these people. You know, I was attracted to like fixer upper relationships. I had a knack for finding broken people so I could fix them up in our relationship and be with them. And then I could never fix them up. Like that's like trying to solve a puzzle piece. It's trying to like solve a puzzle. It's missing pieces. It's just never going to solve, right? And then a lot of the rescuers, they think they're doing they think they're, they're protecting people from suffering and consequences. And they think I'm protecting people from suffering and consequences. That's what you're supposed to do. Now, let me ask you this. Dave Coots, you're a personal trainer. Yep. Uh, your clients, it hurts their muscles when they lift weights. 
So why don't you lift the weights for them and see if they get any stronger? Yeah, come on, <laughs> jerk. And they pay me extra. I mean, don't let people me. suffer. Don't let people suffer. Even if it makes them stronger, don't let them suffer. Yeah, lift yeah. For them. And Steve, you know what? Don't let your kids suffer. Do their homework for them. Don't let them suffer. You don't want people suffering. Come on. No, they suffer in this house. <laughs> they do your homework. That's well, you funny. know, so I mean, that's a funny thing, though, right? Because you've seen that in <clears throat> the last, yeah, depending on how you define it, but maybe the last generation and a half, right? Where you had a bunch of crappy parents or pissed off parents at their parents. So they remove consequences and responsibility, don't teach their kids to work. And now you look at what some of those repercussions are in society. People that are entitled, they can't work, they don't show up. And, you know, when my daughter, Sydney, went to basic training in South Carolina, she gets off the bus and the drill sergeants start yelling at them and people start crying and she's trying not to laugh. And so they got to drop down, do push-ups, do all this crap. And, you know, she's kind of smirking and she, you know, one of the drill sergeants is like, you think this is funny? And she's like... No, but you haven't met my dad, you know, and like we didn't let him get away with crap. Yeah, she wrote letters saying, you know what? Basic training is easy because I know how to push through stuff. I know how to take responsibility and get crap done. And she <clears> outshot <throat> and out tossed hand grenades for most of the guys in her unit, you know, for everything she did because we didn't take consequences away. We didn't fight all their battles. We didn't, you know, we were supportive, but we trusted, but verified. And that allowed her to get through while other people washed out. Some had to go back to jail and, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, I mean, to me, it's, it's, I just, I kind of look at uh, just from a parenting standpoint, the original, uh, you know, Red Dawn when the dad's in prison, Patrick Swayze and uh, Charlie Sheen are down there, right? And the dad just says, hey, you understand now why I'm tough on you, right? Because I got to make you men and I've got to, you have to replace me and not be a watered down version or else we don't get anywhere. Love it. Love it, man. So many wisdom bombs there. You, you got like a whole bunch of drama triangle wisdom bombs. I love so much of what you said there it was brilliant and spot on. And uh, yeah, lots of excellent points. So in future, we can unpack this and go through each one of these individually. They all have baggages and underlying attitudes that predispose us, rescuer, persecutor, victim, and then how to break out a drama, how to escape the drama triangle kind of thing. So we can, we can unpack all of these in future if you all want to. Um, the drama triangles are everywhere. We see it all the time. And it's very poorly understood. That's the one thing with it. It's like, you know, the work that Chris West, Stephen Cartman, Barry and Janae have done is, is excellent work uh, to really gain, gain a bigger understanding of dysfunctional social circles and how they operate and how to not get dragged and sucked into it. But um, yeah, so that's the drama triangle. So why don't we go into uh, final thoughts, key takeaways. Chris, I'm going to start with you. Good to see. You. I didn't see you jump in initially when you jumped in. So, no, I appreciate. It. I appreciated the talk. It was very insightful in a very on um, different, many different ways. And I think my key takeaway is being more aware of not only those roles, but how dynamic those roles are. That they can change and evolve in different ways. And the fact that multiple people can have many people can have the same role in the same team. So you don't have one victim, you can have three victims, you can have one prosecutor, you have three prosecutors. And then all these three people, all these people are changing their roles based on what their narrative needs to be to get their needs met. And I noticed a lot of what you were talking about from the victim's point of view, the rescuer's point of view, and from the prosecutor's point of view, how they're getting their needs met in these indirect ways. And you notice one of the ways to break that triangle was to say what your needs are directly. You notice no one has ever said that in this entire conversation. 
because that is such a key element to breaking that style, style breaking that cycle by you know just saying what are your needs like you said what are just the facts or just saying you know how can I help you so that way you can kind of measure what their need see what their what their real need what needs they're trying to meet in their indirect dysfunctional ways. Yeah, yeah, love it, love it, excellent. Like hitting on that point, like. Hey, do you want me to fix this or, or do you want this just spinning around forever, persecuting, blaming, rescuing, like fighting battles for each other? And like, yeah, it's like, just what is it? And some people want that because they want to get their needs. That's how they get their needs met. Yeah. And you can always say that you can always say no and give people your reasons for not. Yeah. But even if they're like, you know, if, if, if what they're asking for is unreasonable, but, you know, just be direct. What do you want from me? Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Charmaine, final thoughts, key takeaways. Well, I think it takes some um, active participants to keep that triangle going. So choosing not to be an active participant, however that looks, I think is important. And I like the idea of asking questions because I think a lot of people get on a soapbox and they're, they're touting their inner dialogue and interrupting that I think is the key to changing things, but you can't play one of the roles because then that just gives them a platform to spit stuff back at you yeah yeah and it, you know you remind me of another thing is that we shouldn't create a drama triangle about a drama triangle because we, <laughs> hey our friends so and so and so and so and so and so are all doing this yeah isn't that horrible yeah yeah, yeah. oh i'm gonna fix it oh, oh baby. it's like we're just creating a drama triangle about a drama triangle this is getting crazy you know <laughs> It's like one of those Russian dolls and you open it and there's another little Russian doll inside and there's nothing, anyway, I don't know. <laughs> All right, Kootsie Patootsi, uh, final thoughts, key takeaways. Um, yeah, I liked it. Uh, there was a point there I was thinking like, this is like the center of every good Hollywood drama. Like, <laughs> that's what I was thinking. I was like, you just nailed it, man. This is how they write their stories, right? And uh, And then people do it out in real life. And I think, uh, you also called it working on the radar. Well, you've worked on my radar so many things. I see, you know, knocked knees and busted necks and empathy and, and ego. And now I'm going to be seeing this drama triangle every time there's some kind of argument. And I'll be watching for those roles. And uh, and like Charmaine said, just trying not to participate. Right. And uh, yeah, I like it. Great. Very informative. Awesome. And I'm going to get you all the handout too. Uh, oh, nice. Nice. I'm going to be refining it. Once we finish up the final conversation, I'll just throw the handout out there to everybody. I'm still working on the handout. So, um, all right. Hottie Baker, final thought, key takeaway. Well, I lived this last year in a toxic relationship and uh, I was completely blindsided by it. The first couple of months, it was just he and I, and he had been married uh, twice before, had six kids. And uh, two months into the relationship, he is getting ready for me to meet the children. And um, so I'm doing a little research on the kids based on their TikTok and Instagram and trying to learn about them. And I'm realizing there's more than two moms involved in all this. And so uh, a couple of days before he sits me down and says, actually, he's been with four wives and those six kids come from five women. One of those women was while he was married with another. And when those kids became introduced to me, I saw something so toxic where we're always persecuting the mother and the kids are a victim. And now these kids are grown adults. They're 20 plus years old and they are playing this manipulation game. And I'm on the outside going, dude, do you realize how you're being taken advantage of? He's like, really? You know what? What? Well, here he's a rescuer the whole time. These kids are a victim. They keep persecuting their mothers, their boyfriends, their whoever's. And I'm here going, okay, I need to rescue him because obviously he doesn't know what's going on, right? But this is unknowingly happening. And then all of a sudden, I'm like, wait a second. Then who am I in this? Because he needs to be needed by all of these kids. What is, where do I fit into all of this? And how is our relationship dynamic actually working? So now I become the persecutor to him because I'm persecuting him for how he's being a rescuer to all these other kids who should be well on their own doing their own thing. And then I find out the youngest 
20 years junior than him. Do you hear the drama? Is, you know, he, he's 54 years old. He married at 40 years old, a 20 year old, had a child with her. That woman is only a year older than his oldest daughter. There's a whole other drama triangle that's relate that's happening there. He's still rescuing her. And yet she's still playing victim like the kids. But now she's not being persecuted. She's a victim. So now she's playing up that role for all it's worth. And I'm like, man. So finally, I feel like we've got this managed and we're setting healthy boundaries. But somehow he needs to be a rescuer. And he can't now do it in these relationships because boundaries have been set. So now his need for female validation comes everywhere else in his life. And now all of a sudden all these women are showing up and everything else. So I can identify with each person in this. And I can identify in being a rescuer, a persecutor, and a victim at the end of the day. And it led me to a place of, I got to get some counseling and kind of sort this out. And, um, and that's where I realized that this is a no-win situation the best thing that I could do is remove myself from it. And the day that I did, he turned, he crumbled into a victim in the end and said, I'm a victim. I'm this, I'm that. And so I believe whoever you said about this whole thing that in the end, everybody's a victim because in the end, everybody's a victim, including the rescuer. When, when, you know, when you say, Hey, I don't want to play anymore, then everybody becomes a victim. So, uh, so grateful to be out of it. But I think at the end of the day, you try to do your best to see the good in others, right? And you want to try and help and you want to try and be, but at the end of the day, I don't want to be in a foxhole with somebody that I got to show them how to use a weapon and bring a gun and show them how to put the bullets in my life. I want somebody who's going to stand shoulder to shoulder and help support me and encourage me. And, and I want to be personally accountable and, and short up with another person, living life, doing some great things, not working on the drama. And um, it took me several months to even get it all sorted out till I realized it, but you get sucked in so easy. But now that I've been there, Friday night, I went out with a guy and I'm like, look at this dude. He's getting, he's manipulating. I, I'm like, go home, bro. Go home. We're, we're done. That was one thing. <laughs> That, that took two hours and 15 minutes and I sent him home. So, I mean, you know, that just you can now you can see it now that I've been in it and I understand it from all of those roles. Wow. That was a good, that was a brilliant example. And I think that you have pretty much exemplified how complicated and twisted this whole thing gets and how it never goes anywhere meaningful. It's just triangling with switches going all over the place and everything else, and honor and respect you for being through that and trying to make the best you could of it, right? Which is, uh, and we can all get pulled into this in unknowing ways. Um, and we could all be better, maybe. And so we'll be unpacking a lot of that in the future, like how to, like, here's like the 10 thing, the 10 attitudes behind the persecutor role and the rescuer role and the victim role and everything else, and why they're all a bad idea. And here's attitude updates, drama stopping truths that we need to like, come to to be clear on this and and you remind me of a quote by chris west who said you know the discomfort of past mistakes can be a powerful motivation for future pure personal development they can make you more eager to build your understanding and your resilience so you know for anyone who might be getting discouraged by all this drama triangling all over the place just know that that can be a stepping stone for you awakening your highest potential and understanding on how to live it was a great experience for me. I'm so glad that I walked it out. It's made me more assertive. Um, it's allowed me to challenge, you know, relationship dynamics much earlier on. Uh, and um, it's allowed me to take responsibility in, in the relationship as well, rather than just kind of riding the wave and seeing what's best. And, you know, will this will work itself out. You know, I'm a loyal person. It's personality driven too. So there, that kind of plays into it. But um, but just when I saw it, instead of tapping into it to try and work this thing out, um, you know, he was 
he was playing a victim and I was just trying to rescue. And then once I got in that, it just spiraled. So I learned so much from it. And, uh, and I take my own personal responsibility for staying in it as long as I did. I loved the guy. I thought he was a great guy. I just thought he was being manipulated. I realized he wanted, he wanted that he needed to be needed. And the fear of not being needed was, um, was a deep rooted issue that will never be addressed unless he's willing to do that. But we can go into that. That's, that's a that's a victim mentality baggage. That's one of them. Is that- I, I want to add something kind of as a cautionary tale. Um, yep. I do think, you know, in order for this drama triangle to play out, you've got to have people who are playing those roles. You can't have one person in one role and no one else playing and really have this triangle. Because I do think we all have baggage and we all end up in moments where we might be entering one of those roles. And like, if we come to this group, we've got a lot of healthy people in this group that can see that and won't play that other counter role. And I don't think it's something bad to say about someone for embracing that role for a period of time. Those things happen. And I think we have to be careful between people who are thriving on the drama versus people who are having a moment and how we handle those situations and how we react to it. That was so beautifully said. People who are thriving on the drama and people who are having a moment. And the key thing is that no matter what, these are roles. They are not identities. Yeah. He is truly a persecutor. It's a role people may play for a time. They might be in a persecuting state. Nobody is truly the victim. They just do the victim thing, right? They're not truly, so they're not fixed identities. These are roles we might take on. And you know what, and, and some people take these roles on, even though it's not clearly going anywhere. And one of the things is, I think, you know, we all have a right to be stupid if we want to. We all have a right to be confused if we want to. Like, people have a God-given right to do the drama triangle if they want to go for a ride on that thing. And who are we to judge across all space and time? Maybe they do that thing now, and it prevents a greater suffering down the road, or it gives them strength by having gone through this and resilience, so they can create, they can create all kinds of greater things later on in their life. We don't know across all space and time what's best for anybody. And maybe in some ways, the drama triangle and doing this for a while might serve a greater good. Who knows? Well, and I think Charmaine's totally on to something too, right? In that there, there, and, and for me, this helped to identify the players, right? On the stage, because then you can look at it and go, oh, I see where this is going. I want to make sure that I am not playing one of those roles but it also helps you identify like is someone asking for help are they just having a bad day are they like being you know stacked or are things getting a little rough and they need a sounding board or that kind of thing and i think the way you know to that we tell that is is there manipulation behind it or is it oh man you know like one of my, one of my friends talking to her today you know she's coming up short on a couple of her bills and you know she's not getting paid for another week and she's like oh crap you know i've got this this and whatever and delana says you know what why don't you just go take care of this thing right now and be done with it and so it gave her time to you know go drive for an hour to accomplish something in town come back she had dealt with it she's like wow thanks you know that really kind of helped and so she wasn't trying to manipulate anyone she was kind of feeling overwhelmed and we've got a trusting relationship you know delane and i do with her and and we share a lot of tony robbins stuff and there was no guile there was no manipulation there was no victimhood it was just like oh i'm concerned you know i'm worried i don't know what to do and delana gave her a piece of advice she took it it worked out there was an unintended good consequence to it And so I think that Charmaine, you know, is right, right on, on the key, right? If you look at that manipulation is not there, someone's reaching out. They need a friend. They need a hug. They need a sounding board. They need to get it off their chest. And then they move on. If you, if you spot the manipulation early on, like Patty's saying with that douche, you know, from the other night, whatever, then boom, you cut it off because you know, if that is coming out that soon, that that's never going away, right? You do not start trying to manipulate someone with your first interaction with them. You know, you don't, you don't do that. And so I think for me, that was helpful to have these roles identified because then I can go, oh, I see it. 
Yep, Brennan would say it's this, it's that. What do you want from me? Nope, you suck. I am going to join all the other people on LinkedIn, get rid of drama for this year and cut you off and we're done, right? Because there's people all over saying that. I'm done with the drama. I'm done with bad people sucking all my energy and my strength and my spirituality and all that that are manipulating. So I think, Charmaine, you're, you're spot on right there. Manipulation for me is the identifier. If I find that, I'm done. Well, yeah. and Delena opened up to her and said, how about if you took care of this now? How she responded to that right. changed everything. It's whether you're looking for the drama or whether you're looking to solve a problem and just need help with some clarity. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and another example of how this could go in a number of different directions. Let's say somebody had a really bad day and they said a bunch of things they shouldn't have said. And then, you know, in the wake of that, they got a couple ways they could respond. You know, they could take ownership for it. Hey, you know what? I had a bad day. It had nothing to do with any of you. I realized that when I got a bad day, I need to do some things to manage myself instead of trying to like take it out. You know, I've got to learn how to self-soothe my, my intense emotions, blah, blah, blah. Or they might respond like that and take a little bit of ownership, or they might say, well, that wasn't my fault. You made me do that. You made me say all those mean, nasty things. You made me do it. I had to do that. Of course I did. You, this is you, you did it. You, 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 like that's the, that's somebody immediately flipping into persecutor. And then they'll tell somebody else, this person made me do all these things. They made me, I, I was saying all these cruel, mean things and doing all these inappropriate behaviors. They made me do it. It's all them. And then they're like, yeah, you're right. Oh my gosh. And then that's how a drama triangle could, could, I mean, really it's, it's, uh, you know, at the end of the day, there's a, there's a lot of just unwholesome energy behind it. That's, that's really a delicate way of putting it, you know? So Steve, any other final thoughts, key takeaways from you? No, I just, I really appreciate it. I think that's good just to kind of, you know, see, because sometimes there's these things and it's almost like fog that we kind of have a sense for, but it's not tangible. And this really kind of made it tangible to when I start seeing behavior or someone or when I start acting that self to look inward and go, okay, am I, am I being part of this? Or do I just, you know, I just, I I'm a little stressed and concerned. I need, you know, to unload a little bit so someone can help me, you know, work through that. But by making it tangible, you know, then, then I can identify it. I can see those post markers along the way before it was just kind of this weird thing too, right? Because, and I think this group, you know, we kind of know, right? We, we know that we can change our state, like Tony Robbins says, right? Like that, except I'm not changing my state immediately when my cousin dies unexpectedly, right? I've got to mourn that. I've got to process that. I, I can laugh and have good memories, but I'm not just saying, hey, make your move change. You know what I mean? You got to be, you got to be smart. You got to recognize it, it for what it is. And there will be times of profound loss that we have to go through. And there'll be times where we're just living in an emotional dumpster and we got to make our move and change our state and, you know, get out of that. And, you know, we, we all have a skill set and a tool set to do that. But the conceptualization to me was very helpful just to be able to identify looking forward so that I can stop where I am and, and evaluate what's really going on and make sure that I'm not feeding into this because I don't like this crap. You know, I just, I don't, it's, it's emotionally draining being around negative, needy people who it's always, you know, and I just, I don't, I don't like that. And so to me, I'll be looking for the manipulation. When I find it, I'm tapping out. I'm doing a Patty Baker. You're gone, sucker. <laughs> love it, love it. Steve, you had such great wisdom on this one. Such great wisdom on this one. In it's, future, uh, you know, this, this a drama triangle conversation. Well, this, this girl that Sarah that I was talking about, like we've had some great conversations with her where she has had a lot of you know bad relationships different things been manipulated had some things and you know we just get to share a lot of you know like 
Tony Robbins and Jim, Jim Rohn and different things like that stuff that we know, you know, things that, that I've learned here, you know, from uh, Yogananda and from the Bible and different things where she goes, yeah, you know, I never thought about that. Or, oh, you're, you're totally right. You know, I, whatever. And so we have these great conversations and she, I told her today, you need to go start your own nonprofit for this thing. And she's like, I don't know who, how to do that. I said, I don't give a shit. <laughs> you don't need to know. You don't wait till That's you're ready. You do it right now. You outsource what you don't know how to do, like payroll and those kinds of things. And you just put the passion and vision behind it and you go do it, right? You don't wait till you're ready. You're never going to be ready. You're going to shut your face and you're going to go do it. And I'm going to help you. And, but, and she's like, wow, yeah, you're right. And, but it's these things of being able to conceptualize all of these truths, you know, that we've gotten through Tony Robbins over the last couple of years and all the stuff that we share and learn. And I've just been able to, to, you know, have these great conversations with her for the last couple of months. And she responds, that's what's so great. And I can quote her, you know, this person says this, this person teaches this. And uh, because I wasn't always like that, and I didn't always have that skill set. So um, I, it's, it's good to conceptualize it. Because as you're sharing it, you know, you have to, you have to have that tangible nature to it to be able to share it with other people and then you know experience that with them and realize that you know like telling delena if this thing works out with a flight attendant get your hopes up that's awesome because if it doesn't work out there's something better so you're going to get your hopes up and and whatever we're wherever we're supposed to go that's what's going to happen so i don't know we'll see maybe there's some news right now i don't know i'm about to go find out all right man nice love it we're love waiting it. on the update <laughs> uh, i will definitely put it in messenger love it i just put the i just put the uh the logo that kind of has the main information on drama triangle i just threw it into the chat awesome so that uh because i i think you know a good logical stepping stone at this point for anybody is to teach the drama triangle to somebody else because when you have to teach something, you learn it on a deeper level. And right now it's all about developing your acuity with this stuff and being able to recognize it and, and articulate it. And it's something that'll just be a never ending thing. People will try to pull you into, right? And it's draining. It's just not worth it. I mean, you probably all had enough experience with it now. It's just like, not really worth it, you know? And it's not good for people, right? Like when you enable, you disable. Like people end up That's awesome. never developing skills and, and we do it for our own selfish need of being needed. And it's like, you know, for our own wounds that we feel we have to be needed to have value. And it's like, just deal with your own wounds. Stop trying to fix everyone else and keep them, keep them, uh, you know, in their current uh, <laughs> yeah. state. So, all right. So hopefully this was a, a benefit to anybody else who might be watching at any given <laughs> point in time. The recording is we'll post it on YouTube because we're sure way to benefit suffering humanity because we care about people. That's what it all comes down to. And the drama triangle is just another way that we create suffering. And, you know, awareness can have a curative effect. We can at least start to see the signs and recognize and be able to grasp the context and connect the dots that like, hey, this isn't a good way to meet my needs. I should probably not get involved in this stuff, right? So that's the purpose for today. So I want to thank and honor all of you for participating in today's conversation to benefit the public in whatever way it might. And uh, let's do a big friends forever, enemies for never on three. Fist bump, group hug, we're out, okay? So everybody ready? Does everyone know what we're saying? Yes. One, two, three. Friends forever. Friends forever. Thanks, Foxy. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Have a good week. Love you guys. <laughs>